Hello and welcome to the Julia Hartley Brewer Show. In this episode, I'm talking to Posey Parker. She's the online blogger Kelly J. Keane. She's founder of the campaign group Standing for Women, who campaign for the rights of women and girls in the face of trans activism. She's also the woman behind the poster campaign a few years ago saying, woman, noun, adult, human, female, which I think is now tantamount to hate speech. But why has a stay-at-home mum of four become one of the biggest figures of hate for the trans movement? Well, I hope to find out. Don't forget to like, review, comment and subscribe to the Julia Hartley Brewer YouTube channel uh, so you don't miss the next episode of the JHB Show. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Right. Uh, very, very warm welcome uh, to you, uh, Kelly J, or Posey Parker, <laughs> as, uh, as I first came to you as a blogger on trans issues. Um, I think whenever trans issues come up in the news, a lot of people just think, oh, oh, it's that sort of strange identity talk that everyone talks mm. about in the Labour Party. It's got nothing to do with me. I don't care. Live and let live. I'm not bothered. Um, why on earth has a stay-at-home mum of four, happily married, going about your own life, someone from the left, you were a Labour Party member, mm. um, why have you got involved in issues related to trans rights and why do you think that everyone watching and listening right now should be paying attention to what we're talking about? Because it's quite an insidious movement and it's penetrating almost every aspect of our lives, um, whether it's our health service, our police service, our judiciary, it's, it's absolutely everywhere and it threatens the rights that women already have and, and children. So you've been accused of being transphobic. Mm -hmm. I, I've been accused of being transphobic. Um, are you transphobic? I think you're transphobic even if you recognise that women don't have penises. I mean, so... that's a disgusting thing to say. <laughs> That'll never catch on. <laughs> so I think probably by the current understanding of transphobia, yes, I am. But do I... As indeed is probably, what, 95% of the population? I, I would think so. If you're watching this right now, you're transphobic, basically. Yeah, absolutely, if you're not. Uh, but in terms of the, what we mean by, are you? do you have a hatred of people who are trans? Or do you have a fear of people who are trans? No, I, I have uh, the same judgments on people for their character. Uh, you know, whether they're trans or not. Yeah, it's okay. So let's establish that. That's the thing. Um, you, you've been accused of, sort of waging war on, on trans people, whereas I, I would say you are waging war on trans activists. Those aren't necessarily mm. the same group of people. And in your campaign has all been about not, not anti-trans as opposed to pro-women and pro-girls. Yeah. And this is where I first came to hear of you um, back in 2018 uh, when you put up those posters, uh, certainly at the Liverpool Labour Party mm. conference, uh, saying, you know, again, simple, very simple thing. Woman, noun, adult, human, female. Until I think oh, two or three years ago, no one would have questioned that. No one in the mainstream would have questioned that. No. And now we're in a situation, which is one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you today, uh, where we've got the three candidates remaining in the Labour Party leadership race, and no doubt all the others who'd stood would have signed up to this too, have agreed to sign a pledge in which they've agreed that people should be expelled from the Labour Party as transphobic unless they accept that trans women are women, trans men are men, and that basically your sexuality, not sexuality, your, your, your gender, your sex is a matter of opinion and a, and a, and a, and a state of mind rather mm. than a biological fact that is recognised by everybody else. Um, if you don't accept that, you're now transphobic, which I think for most people is in Big Brother kind of thought police territory. Mm. I think that when the Labour Party came out, came out with that nonsense, I think I was uh, quite gleeful because I've understood what's going on with the Labour Party yeah. and this sort of momentum or bromentum um, and how it's been really taken over by quite a sinister bunch of people, I yeah. think, and very authoritarian. And you say this as someone with a you know, background in the Labour Party. Yeah, yeah. I've voted Labour my whole life. Um, and so I was quite pleased because it really does bring it to the fore. But it's also equally incredibly sinister and a bit pathetic that they've all signed up. A bit yeah. sort of, how on earth could you leave, lead the country if you're signing something like this and you're either easily duped, you genuinely believe what you've signed. Is, is that scarier? I think that's scarier. If you genuinely, I mean, for instance, Dawn Butler, who is the, one of the deputy leadership candidates, mm. 
She has gone on television recently and said that children are born without a biological <laughs> sex. I mean, you've got four kids, I've had one. That's news to us. I can remember very specifically a child came out mm. and I was told it was a girl. And, and lo and behold, it yeah. was a girl and she is still a girl. Well, I wonder what, where the investment is there, like why she would say that. And that's either because she believes it or because it's good for her career to say it. Because in their world, yeah, it matters. Now, this is the thing. This is where I really want people to watch this, share this with their friends or their family and, and colleagues. Well, you probably get sacked if you share it with your colleagues. <laughs> yeah. That's the reality these days. But the importance of people discussing this in the mainstream and not a bunch of party activists at Labour Party conference or at some sort of you know library meeting mm. of trans activists on a or, or feminists on a Wednesday night on a rainy day in March. These are issues that a lot of people think are just on the pages of the Guardian. They're not. They're issues that are going to affect real women in the real world and real girls as well. And this stretches from. Um, you know, who, who's allowed in, in the girls' changing room at school, mm. uh, who's, who's, uh, who's allowed in the women's changing rooms, uh, who's competing in women's sport, uh, you know, women only, women only shortlist in the Labour Party, where apparently men are, are, are allowed mm. to be on those now. Um, and we're talking also about rather more serious issues in terms of women's refugees yeah. and women's prisons as well. There's so much to go through, but let's just, let's just go back and sort of start at the beginning about how you how you got involved in all of this, because um, we are in a, we're in a sort of a state of flux when it comes to freedom of speech and saying things. How did you first get involved in this and start becoming a target for the trans activists? Well, I first started getting involved in this in online groups yeah. and um, I would raise a question. So after I'd, I'd been burned in this group where I'd basically said to someone, are you sure you identify as a woman? And then I'd been, absolutely roundly attacked by him mm -hmm. and also by lots of women coming to his defense yeah. uh, and it was it this was, was a trans woman a biological yeah, man yeah. yeah it was it was nasty really nasty and so but then simply uh, for asking a question were you being abusive saying, or no yeah. i mean it, you know I, I probably was quite cross then and, and a bit sort of I was taken aback and I just thought, ah, we're not allowed to talk about this, so mm. then I really want to talk about it. So um, in my Labour Party Women's Forum, I asked the question, does my 11-year-old daughter have the right to use a female-only changing room and not see an adult penis? Yeah. And the responses to that were, you're a bigot, you're transphobic, your daughter's clearly a pervert. Um, and it was just... You were sort of, wow, what happened yeah, it was there? Yes, crazy. So, so something that has been absolutely the norm for decades mm -hmm. since women you know, came out of the home, um, is suddenly now something that makes you a bigot. Yeah. It's that expectation. Despite the fact that, again, most people watching this right now, dads, mums, um, and most, most men who haven't got children, I think, would still go... I don't want to be in the same changing room as a, as an eleven year old girl. I no. would be horrified that I'd make an eleven year old girl feel uncomfortable. Um, yet we're in a situation now where we are fighting for the rights of women to, you know, go to the top shop changing rooms and not have an adult man in there. Um, to go, women, vulnerable women, often who go to prison. Yeah, they've committed crimes. They're behind mm -hmm. bars. Often women who are behind bars are women who have had um, experience of abuse from a partner or a father figure over the years. And we've seen male prisoners <laughs> yeah. um, tra transition, claim they're transitioning mm. so that they can go into women's, women's jails yeah. and even seen a court case as well of this. We'll go into all of that because those are some of the more serious cases. But when it comes to the everyday life that we all lead, just how we go about our normal daily life, lots of people would say, why does it bother you? If, if a man wants to you know, wear women's clothes, um, have electrolysis, um, um, have medication, I don't know, you know, have his bits chopped off and, and have a vagina made from the inside of his penis, whatever it mm. is, um, what's it got to do with you and why does it bother you? Well, none of those things bother me. It bothers me when my right to a female-only space is threatened. Mm. It bothers me that the British police can now, if a policeman identifies as a woman, even if he's had no transition whatsoever, but he, he goes... He could be six foot with a beard. Absolutely. He can intimately search me. And if you... So if you're... Yeah, so if you're going to a police station mm. and you're as a woman, you would have a right to be searched by a woman. Yeah. If he identifies as a woman... Yes. 
he has a right to search you. Yes. And if you complain, you're well, transphobic. I, I would be transphobic. Um, now, in those situations, a, a prisoner or a, a suspect is allowed to, to refuse. Mm -hmm. But there's not too many vulnerable women who are in that position that would know that they could refuse mm -hmm. that person searching them. And more sinister is I get quite a lot of emails or the, perhaps not more sinister, but as sinister, I get quite a lot of emails from women who work in airport security. Yeah. And one instance, there's a man who dresses as a woman for work and he puts little bits of metal because what has to happen with airport security is they have to be searched by their own and they have to make they have to go through the scanners because obviously they would be a security risk. So they have to go through scanners. So he puts metal in his pockets, then he has to be patted down uh, as if he areas. had a female body, which will include a different sort of hand movements. That's just being kinky, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. But this the this difference isn't there between uh, I mean, again, I've interviewed and met a number of, of, of trans men and trans women, more, more, more trans women um, over the years, um, some very prominent uh, uh, who've, you know, people's names, you know, well-known names in the, in the media, who, who are horrified by trans activism, mm. the sort of demand to enter women's space, that what they want is a, to live a quiet life themselves, as they, to live their life uh, and be the, what their true selves. Um, I've certainly never had an issue with that and would actually be very sympathetic, empathetic and supportive and respectful mm. of someone. It makes no difference if you want to wear a dress walking down the street, put on it, good for you and live your best life. should be free from abuse and, and harassment and, and, and everything. It does seem to me that this whole agenda is being hijacked by not just fetishists, but also by heterosexual uh, um, predatory men yes. who are hijacking the rights uh, that the trans activists are, 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 are some perhaps with, with good intentions are trying to get for them um, at the same time and, and using that as a way of gaining access to vulnerable women. Yeah, well, it, when you discuss this with sort of trans activists or people that don't see the dangers, you sort of say, look, come on, uh, men who wanted to abuse children they joined the priesthood to have access. They worked is, in care homes. Yeah, they did. There's no end to, you know, if, you ha if you're that, if you're a predator, you will do whatever it takes to get to your prey. And it just seems quite odd that people don't think that, that you know, people say, oh, nobody's going to put on a dress just to use, use a woman's toilet. Well, of course they are. That's a perfectly they, they, valid, <laughs> valid way to try and get access to a yeah. female space. But, and again, the examples in prison, we've already had cases and we already know mm. a huge number of men who are particularly in jail for sex crimes, mm. for violent, violent, I know, <laughs> violent sexual assaults and rapes mm. of women who have then since transitioned. And as a trans woman, i.e. a woman, mm. um, of which more later, um, they, they have the right to be transferred to a women's prison. We had a case, a ridiculous case, of a man being convicted of sex crimes, being, say he transitioned to being a woman, yeah. moving to a women's prison where he then sexually assaulted a couple of female prisoners. And in the actual case, it was described how he, she, he was obviously the preferred pronoun, yes. she, referring to the biological man and mm. sexual predator, he touched her, or no, he then, ex no, she exposed her penis. Now, I don't know about you, I've not looked in the last few minutes. I'm pretty sure as a woman, I don't own a penis. I'm pretty sure you don't. And I think any woman watching could probably verify that is yeah. the case. Only men have penises, women don't. Mm. Um, and yet the, the, all of the, the court copy, all of the prison documentation referred to him, a man, as a woman yeah. with a penis who had sexually assaulted other women. And that, that will go down as a... On, on, on official statistics mm. as a, a crime committed by women. Yeah. Well, this is when we go, this is like a, a nice lead into pronouns. Yeah. Because you mask all sorts of male violence by using her and she and female pronouns. It's, it's, um, it's really weird as well because you, everybody trips over, even the people who pretend they totally think that that man was a woman. Yeah. They'll trip over all of this because it doesn't make any sense. But you sense. can't say her penis no. or his vagina. No. You can't. It doesn't. It's, <laughs> it's not possible. But this is the thing, isn't it? There, I've always been of the view, certainly when I'm interviewing someone on my show, that as a matter of courtesy, 
I will uh, I will refer to a trans woman uh, as you know, and you know she's coming on my show to talk about. Mm. I, I felt it was a matter of courtesy. You've changed my mind on this because it seemed to me I'm, I'm not willing to be legally required to do so. But we have seen some court cases recently where women have been compelled by yes. a judge to refer to a, a man who has sexually assaulted them as a trans woman, as she, when it was quite clearly a man biologically. Yeah. Um, and you think that actually, even as a courtesy, perhaps one could say they or, 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 or there as a, a middle ground without actually saying she or her. But you think that actually that's a beginning of a very slippery slope and that's where we get into trouble. So you can't yeah. say you're not a woman if you've already said she and her. Well, it's, a, yeah, it's a, the instance, like if you don't want someone to use the women's toilets, to say she can't use the women's toilets, it just, you know, the pronouns are really important. They have quite a powerful quick mm. connect in our brains that send many more uh, messages than just the sex of a person. Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the, I mean, wanting to be courteous and respectful to people shouldn't necessarily entail you completely ripping up thousands of years of our language yeah. and, and, and our understanding of what language means. I mean, words, words only are useful if they have a meaning. Yeah. Um, so if, you, if they no longer have a meaning, then they're, they're, they're useless yeah, to yeah, us. Yeah. yeah, they are. I mean, this is the notion also about a woman. Someone referred to me on my show about a year ago as, well, you're a cis woman. Yes, I and watched I said, that. I said, well, no, I'm not a cis woman, I'm a woman. Well, no, a cis woman, is a, meaning, meaning a born, born uh, as a woman. I said, yes, that's the only kind, as opposed to a trans woman. But trans women are biological men. You're either a woman yeah. or you're not a woman. How dare they try and take that away from women? the word, our language. How dare anybody try and take that? But, but this is the thing, I mean, Douglas Murray wrote about this in his new book, which is tackling a lot of these issues. This idea that, um, that, that you're born gay um, and that you know, you, your sexuality is born. And mm. I, 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 I think the evidence is still being brought about on that. It's certainly something that would seem to me to be very likely. Um, no, I certainly don't have any issue with it. Um, I think I was born straight, so I don't see why someone wouldn't be born gay. Um, and that people who are trans are born in the wrong body. So they've got a, the brain of the body, mm. a brain of the, the sex they want to be. But, they're, but, but women aren't born women. Being a woman is somehow a state of mind. I don't know, mm. an opinion, a choice. In which case, what, what are we? Are we, are we anything? I think we're just right. <laughs> <laughs> or are we just sort of non-men? Are, are, are we just men who haven't decided they're not men yet? I well, don't I th know. I, I think can't. we're non-trans women. That's non -trans what we are. Have you, I've, actually, yeah, you've <laughs> I've been called that, that before. A non-trans non woman. non-trans woman. As opposed to the other kind. Yeah. And again, I do think there are lots of people who don't sort of sit in, you know, Guardian Easter style meetings mm. who will think, why on earth are you talking about all this? Why does it matter? We're talking about... We're talking about a tiny minority. I mean, the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest group of people in this country who are trans. Why does it impose on you? Why does it bother you? Uh, and yet this is now permeating all sort of policing of our speech, yeah. online, social media, in television, and as we've seen with the Labour pledge, policing our politics too. Yeah, well, it's, it's the smaller things, the incidentals that I think are really quite frightening. So it's the elderly woman who doesn't want to leave her home, who wants somebody to come round and, and care for her. Mm. Maybe she needs help with washing. Yeah. If she asks for a woman, she might not get somebody who's genuinely a woman. There was a, a, another lady who was, um, she had a, a breakdown. She was in a psychiatric ward. Uh, it was reported in the Times. And she was frightened that uh, so part of her psychosis was that uh, men were coming to kill her. Yeah. And in the ward was a trans woman that she saw as a man. And she expressed her fear to the nurses who wrote on her notes that she was a transphobic bigot. <sighs> so she wasn't afforded... Supposed to a scared old lady. Yeah. She wasn't afforded the, the um, dignity, even in her most uh, distressful time. Then you've got girls in schools not having their own changing rooms because boys go in. There have been residential trips where girls have been sexually assaulted. Mm. Girls who say that this they're is boys. Happening. People say this isn't yeah. happening. This is happening. It's happening everywhere as well. It's not even just one or two cases. If you talk, which I routinely do, I'm the woman that talks too much at any given moment. Yeah, right back at you. <laughs> and um, if you talk to anyone, they'll go, oh yeah, 
I know. Someone, everyone knows someone. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's but, insane. But toilets, especially uh, uh, my daughter's at a girls' school, so it wouldn't be such an issue. I don't know, unless they decide to let trans girls in. I don't know. Which but, I'm sure they probably well, will yeah, have to. Words, words will have to be had. Mm. Um, but, but again, I wouldn't want to target the child. It just seems to me no. that that's not the solution. No. Go to a mixed school. I think that would be the solution. Yeah. But, but either way... Um, at a time when, you know, te young teenage girls are starting their periods, they're sort of, you know, they're perhaps, you know, a little bit confused about their bodies. You want to be, even I as a 51-year-old woman, I don't want to be in a mixed toilet. I'm no. not, I don't feel threatened. I just don't want to be in a toilet where I don't want men at the urinal at that end or in the cube. I just, men, I don't know any men, gay or straight, <laughs> no. or tra or who want to be in a mixed environment. This, this stuff has just been sort of foisted on people um, and, and no one wants it. I mean, in changing rooms, um, especially, you know, if you're, you know, in, in Marks and Sparks yeah. and you're, you're, you're trying on bras, you've just got a curtain between you uh, and and random men walking yeah. by who then go, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to open your curtain. I yeah. mean, I, that, would, I, I, that would make me uncomfortable. Well, I wouldn't. I don't think I would use a changing room anymore um, in a shop chain that I know doesn't respect yeah. males and females as separate things. So I, I wouldn't use them. But I think it's also, Marks and Spencers, I think, is, is quite sealed. But it's even the thing, so I went there with my daughter recently and someone was having a bra fitting and I'm thinking, first ever, really embarrassed, really embarrassed this girl. And everyone was talking very softly mm -hmm. and trying to make yeah. it really lovely for her. And I thought, imagine then if she hears... A, gr a male voice, yeah. how absolutely devastating and uncomfortable that would be. And inappropriate. Yeah, just terrible. But when you talk, the interesting thing about that is I think men get it more than some women. Uh, and I think even though women understand their own discomfort, Men understand the mind of teenage of boys. Teenage boys, yeah, exactly. I have to say, again, I think most right-thinking men, and I would include men of every sexuality yeah. and don't um, that, go out of their way not to make women feel uncomfortable. Absolutely, Actually, you know, this, we have do. this whole idea of these predatory. Most men are good people. Yeah. So most women, and, and, and they don't want to make other people, certainly not women, feel uncomfortable. They have mothers and sisters yeah. and wives and girlfriends and daughters. And, and, and they would, you know, if you go to a changing room most of the time, the, the man is sitting there just sort of... Just, just sort of like trying to be a small, please yeah. don't notice yeah. me, I'm, I'm here under sufferance. The idea that a man would choose to be in that space instantly raises concerns. I mean, that doesn't mean we shouldn't perhaps have um, special spaces for trans people to change. Yeah, uh, that's seems, not what they want though. No, but that's the thing, it seems to me to be obvious to put, to put, say for instance, toilets, trans and disabled toilets, not in any way saying it's a disability, but just a simple... Let's yeah. just have a separate space where you can have your safety and privacy, but also we're not imposing on the safety yeah. and privacy of other people. That seems to me to be a very obvious, easy and simple mm. compromise. But that's relying on the fact that them, that some of these men wanting to use female space is about validation. It's not really about safety. Yeah. It's about the validation of being a woman. And so that is not answered by saying you can have a special place. And that's the key thing, isn't it? This isn't about um, stopping people having equal rights. And this is where it's very different from, say, gay rights, yeah. isn't it? I mean, Stonewall is a leading gay rights uh, activist group. They've taken this on as their next big battle. Mm. Um, but it's very different from saying that people who are gay or lesbian or bisexual should have equal rights yeah. uh, with straight people. I mean, and certainly I agree, you know, being able to adopt, being able to marry, uh, have employment rights, um, inheritance, um, you know, all, all, all of those things. That, that seems to me to be perfectly, yeah. I mean, uh, or fully supportive of all of that um, but trans rights goes further than that yeah well I, th I think look we've we all should be able to operate in our lives however we want without really causing too much fuss and bother for anybody else yeah. that isn't what trans rights are about it's competing rights but I don't even know what rights they have that they want except the right to force everybody else to say yes I see you as you see yourself which is a step way further than anyone else has ever asked. Yeah. Civil rights in America, black civil rights, they were all about being recognised as, as a human being. As an equal. As a, yeah. And as an equal human being. Um, With feminism, suffragettes. Absolutely. Yeah. All of that is about, sort of, is about coming to this level. Recognising that what I am is equal with you. Yeah. 
Uh, it, that's not, not the same. And why? Because trans activists are asking what? Trans activists are asking to be recognised as something that you may not see them as. So uh, there's no there's no definitions. What is trans? Well, basically, that's anybody that says anything about any. That's that's me sitting here right now and saying, actually, I'm I'm non binary. Stop, calling, stop gender, calling me Kellyanne. Yeah, I'm I'm gender fluid. Um, and therefore, Kelly Jay, that's quite all right. <laughs> I'd rather stop calling you Kelly, because it's not your name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm now male. So even though you're not going to refer to me to, in the third person, yeah. if you do, if I should suddenly leave this room, you have to address me with a, with a male pronoun. I, yeah. So if I said, you know, can you make sure she's got another glass of water, that would be transphobic uh, at that terrible. point. Terrible. But this thing, and that's with the Gender Recognition Act, isn't it? And this was, yeah. again, a lot of people thought it was extraordinary being brought in by a Conservative government. You'd have yeah. thought maybe uh, the loony Labour leadership we've had at the moment, um, and I certainly wouldn't say all Labour, mm. <laughs> I've voted Labour many times in my life as well. Um, but I think a lot of people were surprised that this was something that was being brought in, and, and a lot of people didn't pay much attention to it, but there was a, con right. there was a consultation. So the Gender Recognition Act, well, the idea was that it was really hard. You had to go through a two-year process, have a lot of medical intervention, mm. long procedure, lots of paperwork. It's very difficult for trans people to change their identity formally, legally, be recognised as, yeah. uh, as the gender that they believe that they are. Um, I'm all for making it not particularly, you know, not, not putting in unnecessary barriers yeah. for people to do that. However, this was about, this made such a big change. There would be, you'd have no requirement for no surgery, yeah. no medical intervention, not a single drug in any way inhibiting any of your natural hormones or appearance whatsoever. You would have no, you would not have had to have therapy with a doctor or anything. Mm -hmm. You could simply decide. Yeah on your own uh, merits, that you are, I can just say, no, I'm now Julian Hartley Brewer and I must be treated as a man. Yeah. Um, and to question that would be transphobic, would be hate speech. Mm. Um, I should now have access to all male spaces. Again, what's interesting, of course, we haven't seen trans men, biological women, Im imposing themselves on men's spaces in the same way. It hasn't been such an issue. But why do you think that that is such a concern? Just the fact that they can just, anyone can just say they are a woman and then gain access to women's rights? Well, I think there's a lot of fictions there. Number one, uh, I controversially would revoke the entire GRA. I don't like the legal fiction. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, uh, and this is about also changing your birth certificate, yeah, your passport. I think a progressive and tolerant society would say, John can now call himself Janet, wear a dress, do all those things. Be and safe from persecution need, and absolutely, abuse. Absolutely. And he doesn't need to create a legal fiction in which... His birth certificate is retrospectively changed yeah. to say that he's the opposite sex, which has medical implications and, and implications for others. Um, so that's one thing. Two, I don't think it's... I, I find it very odd that the Conservatives would change the gender recognition sort of the process because that's so difficult. And actually, I don't think it is. You need a couple of... You don't even have to it go It should be a long panel. transition, should it should not? should really. <laughs> but if they really cared about people having arduous and... Um, difficult uh, recognition processes, then maybe they would address the disability, sort of the Atos scandal yeah. and the fact that people have to go through dehumanising processes to prove that they're terminally ill. You say there, there are higher disabled. priorities. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So I think it was the ultimate in virtue signalling from the okay. Tories. I'm my, I'm, I am led to believe that Liz Truss, who is uh, uh, very much uh, the, the minister responsible for this now, um, is, is, is not going to be going forward with this. But I, I would want it not to be just kicked into the long grass. I would want there to be a... Oh, darn, that's my phone, sorry. I would want there to be a formal statement that that was not going ahead for, so for, for the right reasons. Um, but, I mean, this, this is the thing, isn't it? It's, it? it starts getting complicated when you're talking about, you know, the competing rights. Um, and a lot of people just don't understand that these rights are competing. So yeah. that's why you and I will get calls transphobic for just saying... Uh, what about women's and girls' rights? Um, but it's, what's interesting is the first thing that's made perhaps a lot of men sit up and pay attention to this is when it started hitting the arena of sport. Yeah. When, for instance, we've got um, you know the, the front runner for the Olympics, assuming they go ahead in, in Japan this year, uh, is, a, is a trans woman. You just have to look to know that this is a biological man who, what a surprise, and this is going to blow everyone's mind, <laughs> can lift more weights than a woman. I know, Even the best woman in the field. We've seen loads of athletic races, loads of sprints, uh, boxing, yeah. where a man has 
punch the living daylights out of a woman. Yeah. Um, didn't think we allowed that for a good reason. Um, uh, and we've uh, and we've even seen the case recently. The Kent was it? The Kent Cricket Club. Their woman cricketer of the year <laughs> so was a bad. biological six mm. foot man mm. uh, who's undergone no surgery and no hormonal treatment. I yeah. understand. It, is living as a woman. <laughs> the thing about the sport thing, I think everybody gets it. I think that's why men get it because men understand that they are basically better at sport than women. They're, they're born stronger. <laughs> the av so, the average man is so much physically mm. stronger than the average woman. It's it's just a no-brainer. And I I just, the rugby, um, world rugby uh, recently, or might have been the British rugby, had a, a big meeting about what they should do. And I'd, what a waste of time. What you should do is not allow biological men to play rugby with women, full stop. End of discussion, it's just not gonna happen. It's a danger. It's ridiculous. But this is the thing, is it, again, when it's contact sport even more so, mm. then it's about physical safety of yeah. women. And again, you wouldn't put a, a heavyweight boxer in with a, you know, a, a featherweight boxer, yeah. you wouldn't, because that would be dangerous. It would be, it would be unfair, it's not a fair fight. And that's the point. I think, I think when it even just comes to football or cricket or the non-major contact mm. sports, uh, where perhaps you haven't got the same physical, it, it is about fairness and a lot about sport. It is about that's why people are anti-drugs. Yeah. So you're anti. People, this massive big fight about you know uh, athletes not being able mm. to take drugs to improve their performance, but then you're going to allow in a whole collection of so, of biological yeah. men. Who, who, by definition of being born a male and living their life as a male, going through puberty as a male, the yeah. muscle density, the testosterone levels, the, the sheer physical strengths they yeah. have, will by definition be better. Yeah, I think we've got to be really careful with the puberty when, uh, and I know some of the elite athletes have talked about it as well, mm -hmm. but that is kind of paving the way for if we block these poor children's puberty, yeah. these boys, then they can compete. But actually, just the structure of being male, just the DNA code, you know. Uh, just, I mean, just the muscle mass here compared to here. It. I mean, it's, yeah. Just it, the way your hips are shaped, you know, the, the, the fact that women's hips are more sup supple um, because we women can't to, run as fast because we, women no. have got hips to the childbearing. Yeah. So, all of it, I think we have to be really careful that we stick to just. X, 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 Y, that's but, but fine. But even when we're talking about people who've gone through hormonal changes mm. to, to transition to being a trans woman, the, the, these, these biological men have testosterone levels even after transition, yeah. which are, they're not sort of slightly above, they say a normal woman's testosterone level will be there, mm. a normal man's up there, yeah. and they transition down to about here. They're still so far ahead. Yeah. Um, they're so but far. Do you, but do you think the sport issue is, is almost going to be the one that, that where people sit up and go, well, that's not right. I think, Be because, yeah. because people think, oh, it's not happening to me. I've not been in the girls' changing room. But, but they can see, when they see a photograph in the newspaper of a six-foot bloke being <laughs> be competing as a woman, yeah. they may, they're not transphobic. They're not, they're not hating that person. They're no. not, they don't want any harm to come to that person. They don't want to be abused. But they just think, but that's not fair. Yeah. Well, I think um, a man who's tried to bring his testosterone levels down will still be about 10 times as high yeah. as a female East German shop pitter in the 80s. You know, we, yes. you, we, women can't bring our testosterone up it's to where these men possible. bring theirs down. Are you saying men and women are different? I, I think I, I am. Again, are we allowed to say that? No, we're not. <laughs> but isn't that the interesting thing, isn't it? Mm. The, the, the stuff that is, and again, I count myself as a feminist, I'm sure, I'm sure you, not a feminista, I'm sure you do too, but the stuff that is blatantly obvious to the average person, yeah, um, and especially the average parent, if you've had children, the differences in the average child, I mean, some boys will be different, some girls are different, yeah. but you can see these differences across the board. I can see the differences in my female friends and my male friends, mm. female colleagues, because um, why we're we having to all suddenly pretend that it's a state of mind, gender and sex are mutable, in their society's creations, they don't really exist. And if you deny that, you're somehow a bigot. Yeah. Um, it's sort of, again, as I say, it's Orwellian. It's, it's big yeah. brother territory, believing, you know, truth is lies and four plus four, you know, d does equal 27. Mm. And the dangerous thing, so I was talking to a man who works in a bank and he's IT, and he said that he wears now a permanent help for heroes lanyard 
because every LGBT history and Pride Month, he sort of, they try and force him to wear a rainbow lanyard. So it's in your HR departments uh, that you have to go along with all of this, the whole thing. You do, you're not allowed to object or raise yeah. questions. So it's HR, it's the police. You know, it's just, a, it, it's... The, the, po the police, well, we know, I mean, you've been questioned by the police. I have, twice. Um, and what, what was your heinous crime? Six tweets that you shouldn't transition, that it's wrong to transition children and take a boy to Thailand to be castrated at 16. And then the second... Again, there'll be people saying that's outrageous <laughs> that you said that. <laughs> it's, um, can you believe that in that situation, the mother that took her son never had even a breath from the police about that potentially this was... The mutilation uh, of yes, her child, yeah. of, her, of her child's perfectly mm. healthy organs. Well, maybe if she was brown and she took, that child was female and she took her to Africa for... FGM. Yeah, maybe she would have been this questioned. Is it. We are in very difficult territory, aren't we? Mm. And this is where also another big issue that's been risen is, of course, the transitioning of children. Again, people may say, you know what, what adults choose to do is one yeah. thing. I think a lot of us, certainly as a mum, feel very strongly about it when it uh, comes to children. Uh, the Tavistock Clinic in North London um, uh, is facing now a court case, and I think, well, from a couple of people who transitioned uh, through, through their clinic, and I just think not before time. We know that. I mean, some yeah. 35 senior clinical staff at the Tavistock have chosen to resign yeah. in the last couple of years because they're so concerned at the, what's going on there. Uh, this is the biggest transgender clinic I in the UK. Um, although nothing compared with what's going on in the States, as you yeah. mentioned out earlier. But uh, there, particularly, there, there are two people bringing cases, but one in particular is a 23-year-old biological woman yeah. um, who is uh, bringing a case. This is Kira Bell. She's taken the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust to court over the treatment she received for gender dysphoria. So she was 16 years old. She identified as a boy. Uh, so they gave her puberty-delaying drugs, she says, after just three sessions at the Tavistock. She said she had no time to sort of question to doubt. No one gave her therapy, trying to talk her through. She has uh, ended up um, taking puberty-delaying drugs, testosterone prescribed to her. Uh, it's re irreversibly damaged her physical and mental health. And she yeah. says, look, it was done far too quickly. I was a child. They, they, should have, they should have offered me more help, a longer period. Uh, and she is now trying to return. She looks, yeah. she looks male now, beard and everything. She is now trying to return to be a female. But as we know... Um, those gender blocking drugs are not reversible. No. And also fertility is not reversible. Tell us what is going on in that world where children as young as primary age children are being treated with gender dysphoria. Well, it's the same as everywhere else. So doctors are too frightened. Um, I don't have a lot of sympathy, actually, for any clinicians going along with this. I think it's barbaric. Well, also, their, their Hippocratic Oath is... First, do no harm. Yeah, it's just it, it, the whole thing is it, it upsets me more than anything else. And I've met some mothers who've watched their children get sort of sucked in by this. Um, so you go along to your doctor, they don't want anything to do with it, a lot of GPs, and why would they? Uh, but they know that if they don't go along with it, the parents will accuse them of being transphobic mm. because often the parents have had contact with certain uh, trans lobby groups that mm. have told them how to play the system. So then they go to the Tavistock. Tavistock are massively overstretched. There is a culture in the Tavistock of affirmation and it's unquestioning, really. This is basic. You don't question. You don't. It's almost like so. if a 13-year-old if a or an 8-year-old yeah. turns up and says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm biologically a girl, but I think I'm a boy, yeah. to question that in itself is yeah. regarded as being transphobic. Uh, yeah. So you have to... You, even though this is this is a form, I mean, it is a form of mental health. Disorder, of course, isn't it? because it is. it's it's we used to call it body dysmorphia, hating your body, being repulsed by your mm. body, your healthy, natural body. Yeah. That is that is clearly a mental health issue. Yeah. Now, whether or not how you treat that is another matter. But in any other area where a child ex expresses those sort of things, you would treat that. I mean, you wouldn't if someone was anorexic. If a thirteen-year-old girl was anorexic. And, and was absolutely convinced that she was fat, even though she was skeletal. Mm. You wouldn't say, "Yeah, let's carry on. Let's let's, <laughs> let's yeah, let's you. let's help you lose some more weight." Let's I mean, give you, you a gastric band. You mean? I mean, that would be. I mean, you'd be in prison, and quite yeah. rightly, if you did that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, the the affirmation thing uh, is really quite frightening, and I've talked to clinicians who have 
homophobic parents in the room, or the child is autistic. There's a huge, um, isn't it? At least a third of the children, yeah. they think, have got serious autism. Like, I would not, refer, at this present moment in time, I would not refer my child to CAMS because they are very much in affirmation. And I know, anecdotally, um, I know quite a few parents whose children have been teetering on something mm -hmm. and then have been convinced they're trans yeah. after um, some meetings with supposed professionals who are trying to help them. But it doesn't just take the fertility and the sexual development. The sexual development also, puberty is really important. We don't even understand how important it is and what impact it has on the brain. So sometimes it can affect um, working memory, which is sort of a, a symptom of autism. Mm -hmm. So it can have an impact on that. Uh, it increases anxiety. Depression. Um, yeah, all of it. All the things it's supposed to help, it just exacerbates apparently, mm -hmm. and masks. So then the child will feel some euphoria about being affirmed and being like a king in their own life. Yeah, taking and control. Absolutely, and they can force their parents to use different language and the school and their classmates. So they become quite important mm -hmm. in, their, in their own lives. But also often, I mean, certainly I know that a lot of YouTubers uh, are very much pushing this as, you know, I was depressed, I was miserable, I was suicidal, yeah. um, and then this solved everything. Mm. And then if you've got, I mean, if, if you're a parent of a young child who's threatening suicide, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna do everything I can to yeah. keep my child alive and if that's what they want and it keeps them alive apps you know yes I'll yeah. say yes and that's the thing and yet of course we know that suicide rates after transition are, are even higher of course that's the, because you sentence. don't get where you think you're going uh, and it doesn't solve everything but also that actually the the in, the in the vast majority of cases where you've not seen clinicians pushing this whether for good, you know, they may do it out of very good reasons. They may genuinely feel, you know, mm. they're doing the right thing. But that, but where that's not being pushed and where people just go through therapy and you know, talking uh, therapy through, through years, uh, the vast majority of those who've expressed issues about their gender identity go on to live perfectly happy lives in yeah. the body they were born in, because that is their body, um, are often living uh, as, as gay. Yeah. Um, and that's been part of the confusion, perhaps, about their body um, and also remaining fertile. And I think this is the thing. It's not just the, 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 the horrible damage that people are doing to these children's bodies, perfectly healthy, beautiful bodies yeah. um, forever. Um, but, but also the fact that they're making these children infertile. And yeah. how can you at the age of 12 even begin to fathom what you know what life as childless life would be like and, and also of course these children often uh, they they take away they kind of they strip away their sexuality and partially replace it with another sexuality uh, well g gender sorry but they they don't they don't keep for instance the ability to have an orgasm no it's we well, sort of big part of people's lives well it's i i wonder if it's symptomatic really and, and a really horrible um example of the fact that Two of, you know, just think of a photo filter and the fact that all these kids are spending so much time staring in a camera, yeah. not with their own face, but with a filtered face. So then they become this thing online yeah. that isn't representative of themselves. And it's the same. Their genitals or their body might look like yeah. the sex that they feel they might be, but it won't feel like it. It yeah. won't work like it. Yeah. Um, they won't have any of the the joys and the benefits of being an adult in their own healthy, sexed body. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. And I think perhaps a lot of parents aren't thinking about that, such as the parents are actually no. uh, asked about this. I mean, you can go ahead with this often without the parents uh, having a, any, any say at all. Yeah, that's repulsive. Um, which is very difficult. Um, but you, I mean, you in particular, and you've, you've mentioned the organisation a little bit earlier in passing without mentioning it, but you, you've had some specific battles with, with Susie Green, who's the head of Mermaids, yeah. uh, a group that is helping uh, young people and families through transition. And I've had her on my show a few years ago. I remember just thinking, oh, this is a wonderful woman doing wonderful work you know, to help young trans people. Mm. Um, and she herself as a trans, uh, what, she's a trans girl now, Yes. A trans woman, her, her son, uh, as you mentioned, taken at 16 to Thailand mm. to have an operation that isn't available here at 16 for a really good reason. Yeah. And no longer child. in Thailand either. Um, interestingly. Since that. Um, but you say so you got in trouble with the police for stating the simple fact yeah. that she had done this. Um, but this is an organisation that gets huge amounts, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds of government funding to help propagate the yeah. trans activism. And now they would say, look, we're, we're just helping families and children go through a difficult time. Mm. Why do you think that's not what they're doing? 
I have my theories about people that, that set up or work for charities that transition children who have transitioned their own children. And I think that sort of this is a circular needing to justify what you've done by making it okay with the rest of the world and then you can okay it with yourself. So I think it's sort of a dark soul, <laughs> trying to cleanse your dark soul. Um, and I'm not even religious. I do think there's something weird about all the sex of the people going along with it. So mothers will go along with it more than fathers yeah. if a kid says they're trans. Um, whereas fathers are more likely to disrupt the whole family and transition themselves. And then you get systems of abuse within that family yeah. and there's also quite a lot of narcissism and women call themselves trans widows and the yeah. children really suffer, especially if you've got daughters. So the daughters of men that transition to women often get, uh, this is anecdotal, uh, but often get fetishized about and the fathers will sort of ask them to borrow sanitary towels and things and it's mm. all quite sinister. Um, but I think there's, I think there's links with Munchausen, where for the mothers, yeah, absolutely, where women. So Munchausen by mind, proxy. Look, you're, you're not a medical professional. No, These absolutely are, this is just something you've been looking at for a long. I've been looking at this for yeah. five years, and I've because I think what we have to do is we have to understand where it comes from in order to stop it. Yeah. And I also think, that, you know, my my purpose. I've always felt that I want to reach people that don't know about this because I think. Yeah. If they find out what's going on, they're going to object because it's But this is it. It's silly. only recently that people have found out. And again, I, again I, when I did first find out, I thought that the people involved in this were doing, were doing yeah. good things. They were trying to help people who I think, I think, I mean, I was born into a body I'm perfectly happy with and, uh, and, and born a sexuality I'm perfectly happy. I've never questioned this for an inch in my life. And I can understand how awful it must be yeah. people. But it's this idea that transitioning, particularly as a child, um, as, a, as, a, as a confused teenager, is the answer to all your problems. Yeah. It's very unlikely. And also just even now the concept that, can you be born in the wrong body? <laughs> I mean, there's, I, don't, I don't have any, any difficulty dealing with the idea that people are gay or straight. You fancy who you fancy. There, yeah. there, there, there's evidence of, of, of gay relationships in, in many different mammals, you know. And yeah. So I don't think that's a struggle at all. And there may well be perfectly good biological genetic reasons why yeah. that is the case. Um, but in but anyway, in no way does a man or a woman being gay and who you love and who you choose to have sex with is no business of mine yeah. uh, or anyone else's. In the same way that you know who I choose isn't their business. Um, but but the thing about the trans trans issue is is not people just changing their own lives. It's it's now the pressure on children and particularly young girls. The number of young women, young girls, they're not women. They're girls. They're children going to the Tavistock now. I mean, it's shot up from, you know, a, a few dozen mm. to the thousands in the last few years. Yeah. Which is a particular concern. Like, where has that come from? The number yeah. of your boys as well are shot up, but nothing like the same rate. This is about children, but it's also, again, as we discussed earlier, about protecting women and girls who, who, who mm. just want to have a safe existence in some, some limited women-only spaces, like changing yeah. rooms or prisons or wherever. Well, we didn't used to, like, Teenagers, I'm sure teenage girls more than boys have always had some sort of trial and tribulation throughout puberty. I don't yeah. think it's a great time. But we've never had states, the state sanctioning uh, the abuse. So yeah. uh, we've now got a, a BBC programme with a doctor. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she's sort of a non-binary doctor uh, telling girls about binders. And it's about BBC. binding your breasts to make yeah. so so you so you look like a boy, you bind yeah. your breasts. But it's supposedly to do it in a way that is safe and doesn't hurt. Um, you're not <laughs> supposed to bind your breasts. Your breasts it's, are natural. But we have to work out what this is what is happening where we're getting to a point where girls in America, girls are having double mastectomies who just feel non binary. There's this what does there's that an even obsession mean? with breasts. Well, I have it doesn't mean anything, does it? It means I'm very, very special. I'm not even male or female. It's just but again, a, but yes, it's but again, I think most people watch this, it's it's, it's meaningless. I mean you yeah. you either are I mean, you know, you either are biologically a male or biologically a female. I mean there are some very tiny, tiny, tiny yeah. percentage of people born in the world who who have um the uh the the, the often the, the, the genitals or of of both sexes yeah. and, and some confused hormones. We are talking about a tiny, tiny group yeah. of people though. But this I I think we do have to get to the root of why 
why specifically breasts are becoming such a, a big thing in the, in the lives of these girls that they want to remove them or they want to not appear that they have them. And these won't just be girls that think they're boys or want to be boys. These are just be girls that don't, don't want to be women. I think that's the difference between the boys and the girls in this. Boys actively want to be girls yeah. when they say they're trans. Girls, the majority of them, just don't want to be women. And we have to get to the Why, root of that. Yeah, what is going on? Well, I, 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 I no do we're, we're not going to get to the root of it unless we actually have more conversations like this. And, mm. and yet, there will be people, I'm sure there will be complaints when this goes out. Oh, goodness, yes. Um, and probably if you call to the police, and you know, good luck is all I can say <laughs> to those people, because we have a right in a free country to debate these things. You're not coming from this, or well, neither am I, from a position of hatred or fear or no. anger at, or at trans people at all. This is about concern for young children, male and female, yeah. uh, for the parents uh, and for the adult uh, trans people. I don't want uh, trans, uh, you know, genuine trans people to to face any uh, backlash from the activities of a minority of activists who are doing no one any good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just it just comes back to the point that often people, you know, we've always had oddities in society. It's just that this time we are putting those oddities and self-loathing at the sort of top of our agendas. Mm. And we are telling everybody else that these are the most brave and stunning people on the planet. And I, I, when they're possibly, possibly sort of people who deserve our empathy, yeah. who are confused and need help, rather than perhaps the solution that has been thrust upon them. Absolutely. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I'm, I think you've been a very brave campaigner, I have to Thanks. say, and uh, I, I proudly wear my uh, a woman noun, adult human female, and will continue to do so, Tisha, um, because it is important that, that we do shout about this. Um, and lots of people who perhaps started this thinking, well, why is this an issue? I hope they will understand it really is yeah. an issue these days. And it's going to be an issue for your for your wife, your girlfriend, your, your daughter, your sister, uh, if you're not, even if you're not a woman yourself. And this issue is going to keep uh, rearing its ugly head until we confront it, you know, instead on. And, and, and the right thinking people, uh, you know, make sure that we, we, we confront it in a, in a thoughtful, and, and kind and empathetic way, but that we also have empathy for the women whose yeah. faces are being taken over and whose safety is being jeopardized uh, by some men who mm -hmm. can call themselves whatever they are, but are still men. Yeah. Um, absolutely lovely to see you today. Kelly uh, J. Keane, really appreciate it, otherwise known as Posey Parker. Yes. Thank you very much for talking to me here on the Julia Hartley Thank Bureau you. Show. Well, if you've enjoyed what you've seen and what you've heard, don't forget to like, review, comment and subscribe to the Julia Hartley Brewer YouTube channel so you don't miss the next episode of the JHB Show. Thank you.